on behalf of the American Bar Association Rule of Law Initiative, I would like to cordially welcome the panelists, everyone in this room, as well as our online participants to the annual Rule of Law Conference. I am uh, Paulina Rudnika, and I am a senior legal analyst at ABE Rowley, and this is a true honor and privilege to be moderating uh, this very important and timely panel on gender-based violence interventions in conflict, post-conflict, and transitioning states. Less than two years ago, we all became captivated by the story of a young New Delhi woman who had been gang raped and violated with a metal rod while traveling on a bus um, from a movie theater. She later died of massive injuries and the brutal attack against her became a symbol of widespread violence against women and widespread, widespread mistreatment of women across India. In September 2013, the world learned about an eight-year-old Yemeni girl who had died of uterine rupture and internal bleeding on her wedding night after marrying a man who was five uh, times her age. In 2011, a case of Jean-Paul, a young Congolese man, surfaced. Two years earlier, Jean-Paul was abducted along with six men and six women by rebels as he was trying to escape the war-torn Eastern Democratic of Congo. Later that day, and every night that followed, he was, multiple, he was raped multiple times along with all the male um, prisoners. Despite receiving hospital treatment, Jean-Paul would experience pain and bleeding for many years after he managed to escape his captors. As recently as two weeks ago, the media reported a, a case of an 18-year-old girl, Eth Ethiopian woman, who was con conv convicted by a Sudanese court of indecent acts after she had been lured to an empty property and gang raped while three months pregnant. She was arrested and sentenced to one month in jail and an equivalent of $800 in fines after a video of her being assaulted was circulated on social media by one of the perpetrators. She had also faced char charges of adultery and prostitution, which could have led to a death penalty by stoning, but these were dropped after she convinced the court that she was divorced. Stories like this are obviously not um, isolated. In fact, not a day goes by without multiple accounts of gruesome attacks of sexual and gender-based violence committed by st state and non-state actors. According to a 2013 Global Review of, of Available Data, 35% of women worldwide have, been, have experienced some form of physical or sexual violence. In some parts of the world, for example, in rural Ethiopia, the prevalence of intimate partner violence alone has exceeded 70%. More than 64 million girls are child brides, and approximately 140 million girls and women have suffered female genital mutil mutilation. Because there has been very little research um, done into the rape of men, it is not possible to say, say with any certainty how common it is, although a rare 2010 survey found that 22% of men and 30% of women in Eastern Congo reported conflict-related sexual violence. Sexual and gender-based violence is one of the most systematic and widespread human rights violations. While women and girls are disproportionately affected because of unequal social structures and prevalent discrimination, incidents of sexual violence against men and boys, particularly during wartime, are not uncommon, though rarely reported and spoken about. Lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer persons are also at high risk of abuse on account of their gender, gender identity, and sexual orientation. This global pandemic is fueled by a flourishing rape culture and a highly disturbing co-epidemic of blaming and shaming the victims, which can take many forms, from seemingly subtle attempts at, at discrediting victims' stories in family and social circles, through harassment, ostracism, and outright public attacks 
attacks on their decency, dignity, and credibility, to imprisonment, honor killings, and physical punishment for committing moral crimes or indecent acts. As a result, most, most rape victims around the world remain silent. Even in the US, only 40% of sexual assaults are reported to the police. There is, of course, a wide range of strategies that can be employed to address gender-based violence, from preventative measures and awareness-raising campaigns, through adopting and implementing stable, fair, and human rights-based uh, um, legal and policy frameworks, to creating holistic and well-coordinated services for survivors, and ensuring their access to justice while giving due attention to vulnerable and undeserved, underserved populations. Equally important is the establishment of data collection, monitoring, and analysis systems that can determine the prevalence of gender-based violence and help us ensure that lessons learned and, and best practices are captured and reflected in future interventions. The ABA Rule of Law Initiative has worked extensively to improve global response to gender-based violence, particularly domestic violence and sexual violence, violence used as a weapon of war since 1996. We promote reforms that foster women's empowerment and improve their legal status. We assist local stakeholders with their legislative drafting efforts. We work with local civil society organizations to implement legal awareness, legal aid, and advocacy programs, and we utilize early warning systems to protect vulnerable communities and prevent mass rapes. We also address impunity by building the capacity of justice systems across actors to prosecute and fairly adjudicate GBV cases. We also facilitate the deployment of mobile investigation teams and mobile courts to rural and underserved areas. <coughs> With me today are four wonderful distinguished experts who will share their perspectives on four pillars of effective, multi-sectoral, and rights-based response to gender-based violence. These four pillars are prevention, protection, accountability, and monitoring and evaluation. <laughs> 